Welcome, Initiates. Today's word from the Akasha, it's actually a phrase, is Lord of Karma. We're going to explain what that means, and we're going to build on what we gave as a previous Akasha podcast called Doppelganger, when we talked about the dweller on the threshold, who's also called the guardian of the threshold. Now, when we gave the first presentation, we did not talk so much about the two different guardians because it is such a comprehensive topic when you're talking about enlightenment and initiation, the I am, the ego, the self. When you're talking about all of these things, it is very difficult to fit it all into one presentation. So today we're going to talk about, again, a little bit about the lesser guardian of the threshold and about the greater guardian. Greater, greater. Aha! Now remember, if you catch me making a mistake up here and you send in a notification, it's going to give you one brownie point. And so uh, when you get to the gates and you see St. Peter, you just say, hey, I, I got some kudos from uh, catching errors on Dr. Gabriel's presentation here. So uh, as we look at this, we already heard a little bit about the greater and the lesser guardian. And we found out that in initiation, once you've reached the first stages of enlightenment, and let me just clarify that again, all you have to do to reach the first stage of enlightenment is hang out with somebody who's enlightened, watch the way they do it, and that's it. That's all it takes, literally. It's the simplest thing in the world. You simply mimic the model that you use, and that's why people say get a guru, get a teacher, and then just simply uh, believe in them, love them, and mimic them, and they be you emulate them. They become your idol in a way, and uh, you follow their example. Well, that's what you can do in the process of initiation, but as you approach the guardian of the threshold, as you approach the threshold between the physical and the spiritual world, you're going to be pushed back, because the spiritual world doesn't want your garbage. They don't want your animalistic thinking, your animalistic feeling, or your animalistic willing. They don't want your bad deeds. They don't want your negative karma. As a matter of fact, it can't exist in that realm. And if you're trying to bring over your earthbound thinking or your fleshly desires or your path to perdition that you are participating in in the physical world, it will never make it. So you're going to be pushed back by this scary monster in the scary monster, over time, we're going to talk about the images used by people to describe this ferocious monster over time. What you find out at the end, which we put in the article, a description, that like the Tibetans believe that after you die, you enter into the um, intermediate realm and then you enter into the Bardo. When you enter the Bardo, you keep having these fierce monsters come at you, attacking you. And who are they? They are you. They are your unredeemed thinking, feeling, and willing. They're fierce monsters who know you better than anyone, and they are animalistic, and they will make you wake up. As you go through the process of initiation, you learn to take those impulses of those beings at the threshold and redeem them. And you take your bad thinking and you use it as a guidepost to warn you in the future that as you are, again, having bad thoughts, that there's a karmic consequence for that. And that's the blessing of what we're going to talk about here today, that Christ has become the Lord of Karma. And this is a great boon for humanity. This is a great, great thing. Because Christ can mitigate your karma, because He's a member of the Holy Trinity, and has permeated all nine ranks of the hierarchy, and has the capacity to literally mitigate, change karma, even if it's a, a natural catastrophe, a man-made catastrophe. It doesn't matter. As the Lord of Karma, and He took over from these beings over here called the Lords of Karma from the ancient Hindu um, ancient East, uh, the philosophy of the East, they called them the Lords of Karma, and they had the name Lipikas. And Lipikas is describing these Lords of Karma. They are also called the Builders. A lot of times in science fiction movies, you'll see the most ancient character called the Builder. These are the Builders. They're also called uh, Dionic beings, and they're also called the beings who control birth, death, and karma. So that's how they got the name Lords of Karma, but they're also the Lords of Birth and Death. Now, Karma. Karma wasn't incurred until the human being was given an ego 
that had freedom so that out of the mistakes that we made, we might incur negative karma, and out of the positive things that we did, we incurred good karma. But that really didn't settle into the human being until quite late, about, you saw it with Abraham around 2000 uh, BC, the, Abra the Abrahamic age, and you um, saw it in a variety of ways that it manifested in history that the I am, the ego of the human being, started to actually indwell in the human being. But where did it come from? And this is the big question, because as we have been struggling, and I say we, that's not me in the mouse of my pocket, that's me and John Barnwell, have been discussing the I am, or the greater consciousness and the human consciousness, cosmic consciousness, we have run up against the difficulty that it may take thousands of uh, podcasts to actually comprehensively cover this because you have to tell a biography not only of the I am of the human being, which you have to look all the way into the past and see that as I'm describing here, even the beings that dealt with our karma were quite different in the past, and we were different in the past, what we are now and then what we're going to become in the future. If you don't know that, if you don't have a cosmology that describes that, you're not going to get very far with this. So when you meet these three beasts, as you will, when you go to sleep, except nowadays, in the past, people didn't go to sleep the way we do now. We don't have natural clairvoyance like the ancients had. They could see into the spiritual world even in waking consciousness through kind of a dreamy, natural clairvoyance. We cannot. So we don't really know that the spiritual world exists, and that's where we go at night when we sleep. That's where we go when we meditate and cross the threshold into the spiritual world. That's where we go when we are initiated um, in a variety of different types of initiation. But the initiation is to connect your soul with your higher spirit. And then when we cross the threshold at the time of death. If we are crossing the threshold in, during sleep or initiation or meditation, we are only going to meet the lesser guardian because we're not going to die. We're only going to meet the greater guardian if we die and we separate ourselves from our etheric and physical body and our astral body goes through what's called kamaloka, kind of a dissolving stage after death. And then your ego or your reincarnating ego, your reincarnating I am, which we've discussed at great length, which is a, the eternal components of two of the spiritual egos that you have, spiritual selves that you have, one found in the spirit self and one found in life spirit. A combination of those two, what we call uh, Budi Manas, or what Blavatsky and Theosophists and Steiner called Budi Manas, if we take the life spirit and the spirit self and we glean what is eternal, that is what reincarnates. But to understand that, you'd have to understand where that ego came from. You'd have to understand the development of that ego. You'd have to understand the stages of development in human uh, physiological development. You'd also have to understand the birth of the physical body, the birth of the etheric body, the birth of the astral body, and the birth of the ego. And we'd have to know how that relates to the model that we're following, which is the model of Christ. Christ Jesus, but Christ, even before he came into Jesus of Nazareth, was a solar being who worked through the realm of the Holy Trinity and all the way down through the hierarchy and focused in the realm of the Elohim, who are also called the spirits of Exousiae, or the spirits of Forum, or these beings, created the ego of the human being. And if we follow that history, we can also follow Christ's deeds, which we'll do in a minute. But let's go back to a second and describe a little bit about these lords of karma. In ancient India, going back to, let's just say, 10,000 BC, the Lipikas were beings who could not give or take. They were the only beings in the entire pantheon of hundreds and hundreds of deities and um, higher beings that we would call hierarchical beings, only these lords of karma did not take or give. They had no karma. They were so far removed from it that they literally probably couldn't have even understood the nature of the human being at that time or the nature of the human being at this time. In other words, you could basically call them good accountants. They didn't give, they didn't take, they didn't pass judgment. They simply recorded. Well, birth, death, and karma? 
What's that sound like? That sounds like Brahma, Vish, uh, Shiva, and Vishnu. And so one might say that the trinity of the lords of karma replicate the trinity of the three gods and the three goddesses, of course, uh, Saraswati, uh, uh, Lakshmi, and um, Parvati, their consorts who were actually before them, and they came from a being called Vak, V-A-C, and she came from Akasha, which we've discussed before. So if you really want to talk about karma, you talk about these beings who don't give or take. It's like a vacuum. It's like the space in an atom. They just record. That's all they do. And basically, you're describing what the Akashic records do, the Akashic Chronicles or the Halls of Wisdom. Many names for these things, but they would call them in the past the Builders. So you would enter into the realm of the Builders after you died to find out what caste system or what caste you would be in in your next incarnation. In other words, you would be judged by these beings without any love or compassion, without any counseling, without any uh, karmic mitigation to be, if you were an untouchable in one incarnation, you were probably going to be an untouchable in another incarnation in India. Or you could be a Brahmin, or you could be a, a warrior or a merchant ca uh, caste. But the point is, when you died, you were judged. And then your next incarnation would be the result of that judgment. And so that's where the concept of lords of karma comes from. Um, they didn't have much power, and they supposedly no longer exist. Now, why they don't any longer exist, and why no one actually prays to the builders, the Lipikas, is because they've changed. They've changed radically, and anyone who's clairvoyant, as they cross the threshold, would know that. Now, mind you, in the ancient Indian times, they did have different images for these beings. But let's take here in America. Um, with the lesser and the greater guardian in America, uh, one of the most common traditions was that you met the coyote being at the, uh, when you were going into transcendental experience, when you were trying to go into the sky, as they would call it, to meet the great thunderbird, who was the greater guardian, the thunderbird. And so you would meet the coyote, but the coyote was a trickster, and the trickster would keep pushing you back away from the spiritual world, basically saying, you can't get in here. You're too impure. You need to work on this and work on that. And so the coyote was also, um, in Tibetan Buddhism, they call it crazy wisdom. So it seems as if the coyote wouldn't be your friend because they're kind of mean and they're like a jackal, a hyena. Well, that's exactly what the guardian of the threshold, the lesser guardian, looks like. As a matter of fact, we'll talk about the fact that the three-headed dog of the Greeks is the same thing. Uh, and that um, also the jackal-headed uh, Hermes, or the jackal-headed god Anubis, uh, is very uh, indicative of the coyote. It's kind of scary, and scary for the right reason. It has to push you back from the threshold. But if you die, then you're going to be judged by the Thunderbird. And why the Thunderbird? The Thunderbird looks down from the sky and sees everything. That's what the ancient Indians and Americans believed. And they believed that when you died, if you had good merit, and if you truly had worshipped the uh, Thunderbird god in the sky, who was really a father-mother god, then you would be able to fly into the sky. In other words, you'd be able to go into the spiritual world. In other words, once you pass the coyote and you pass the tricks and you got rid of your lower self, the coyote self, you were able to merge with the thunderbird in the sky. Well, that isn't far from what the ancient Indians believed, that once you lived your life, if you really were a moral person, you would merge with the at, uh, your Atman inside of you, would merge with Brahman in the universe, and because they always were one, according to the ancient Indians. But in this case, the Thunderbird and you are one if you have morality and you can rise up into the sky. Well, isn't that what happened to the Greek heroes? If they had morality, they were raised into the sky. Look at Psyche and Eros. Eros came down, Psyche was so beautiful, a human, but in the end, Psyche was raised into the heavens to live eternally in the stars. Well, that's the whole point. The whole point of understanding the lesser and greater guardian is to understand that you are not a mortal being, you are an immortal being. And the way that you get there is to emulate, uh, or what in Tibetan Buddhism we call Vajrayana, you practice being the highest saints and deities and 
spiritual beings that you know of. And as you practice being them, you eventually become like them. In ancient Egypt, what did they think the lesser guardian was? Well, remember, we talked about the fact that ancient Egyptians really didn't have much of an ego. They didn't have a personal history. They didn't have really um, what you would call an Akashic memory of their past lives because they really weren't very ego-centered, I am centered. They didn't have individual intellectual consciousness, or what we now call abstract thinking, which mathematics is a keynote uh, method of developing abstract thinking. So the ancient Egyptians basically lived their life in somewhat of a trance, and when they went to sleep at night, they saw the Sphinx far away, far away, way over there. They didn't see the Sphinx. The Sphinx didn't get up in their face and scare them. This being that they couldn't figure out, was it a woman, was it a lion, was it an eagle, was it a cow? What in the world was it? And, and as we know from some of the stories, the Sphinx would ask them riddles. And what was the riddle they asked? What goes on four legs and then two legs and then three legs? And what is that? A human being. Four as a baby, two as an adult, and three with a cane. And what is that? That's asking what is the I am of the human being in the past, the present, and the future? So the Sphinx would ask the Egyptian, who are you? But the Egyptian really didn't have much to respond. And then, if they could get through the riddles, uh, after they died, uh, the god Hermes would appear as Anubis and take them through death, and take them through embalming, and take them to Anubis. And Anubis, the jackal-headed god, was supposed to scare people. The jackals were very scary to them in those times. And the Anubis would weigh their heart, or their soul, against an ostrich feather. And if your heart was heavier than an ostrich feather, you couldn't enter into the underworld consciously. So this again was two different beings, the lesser guardian, the Sphinx, the greater guardian, Anubis. Here in Greece, we already mentioned that the, you get to the uh, gates of hell, and the first thing you meet is this monster, Cerebus, who has three heads, snakes coming out of its body, sometimes three bodies, everything horrible you can imagine. That's what this being is. What is that? Those are your three lower selves or excuse me, the three doubles, which are part of your lower self. So that's your bad thinking, bad feeling, bad willing, and it's there to eat you. What does this dog do? It eats flesh. Well, that's a good thing, because you can't take flesh into the spiritual world, and you can't take your lower desires into the spiritual world. You can't take your hatred, your fear, and your doubt. And that's what this three-headed animal of yourself was representing. And of course, Hercules had to go down and wrestle this being, bring it back up, and show it as one of his, um, the 12 labors of Hercules. Uh, but really, all you had to do was be prepared. And when you were called, and you wished to cross the threshold, whether through sleep, initiation, um, or meditation, you took raw meat with you. And when you saw this, you threw the raw meat to the dog, and the dog would eat that raw meat, and not you. Well, that is good. What does that represent? That means you take all of your lower nature, which is like raw meat, and you let the dog eat it. Because you got to. You can't get to the next stage. And what is the next stage? You come to the river Styx. Don't stick your finger in it, because that's horrible. It's, it's the worst curse you can have. And only Charon, the ferryman, can take you across the river Styx, but he can't take you across the river Styx until he sees in your mouth the coin that was put there as part of the sacred ritual of burying you. And that would have only happened if you were a moral person. An immoral person would not have had uh, raw meat buried with them and a coin in their mouth. They would have gone without those and therefore they couldn't have gotten through the hound of hell, and they couldn't have crossed the river Styx. But if they could, then they would go into the afterworld, and then that's another, the whole story. Now, in kind of the beginning of Christian times, um, one might imagine that the lesser guardian was the Archangel Michael, who of course people like to correct me and say he is now the Archi Michael, and that is true. But in the past, as the Archangel Michael, he had a sword, which he cast Lucifer out of heaven with, and he has scales because he was considered the judge of the soul. But this is the judge of the soul every night you go to sleep. 
So every night you go to sleep, if you don't pray and you don't rectify your actions and you don't review your thoughts, your feelings, and your deeds and see how they hurt other people or whether they helped other people, then when you start to go to sleep, you're going to see a fiery sword there. It's called the fiery sword of the cherub, keeping you from going into paradise. It could also be called the fiery sword of Michael, or sometimes the spear. One way or the other, it's standing there to guard you from crossing the threshold until you have done a self-evaluation, until you've weighed your own actions upon the scales and found yourself to be worthy uh, and that your morality outweighed your immorality. And if that's the case, then every single night you go to sleep, if you had a pure soul and you could meet this being, you could then commune with higher spiritual beings while you're in the dream world. Because the dream world is the same world as the world of after, birth, after death, and it's also the same world as before birth. Now, the Christians would always say in a loving way that St. Peter is there at the gates of heaven, the pearly gates of heaven, with the keys. And when you get there, somehow you have to convince St. Peter, or somehow St. Peter knows whether you've been a good or a bad boy. It's kind of like Santa Claus in his book of uh, uh, Golden Deeds uh, and his book of Good and Bad. It's the Akashic Records. It's your karma. And so if St. Peter, for whatever reason, sees that your karma makes it that you get to enter the gates of heaven, he opens it for you. Now, that's a little bit of the past, going way into the past. And, of course, we have up here that the Archangel Michael has a sword and scales. But what I've written under here is Christ is the midwife. And that's where we're at now. Christ is the midwife of your soul and your spirit and your body, your etheric body, your astral body, your ego. Christ has donated all of those things to you and helped you learn to use them in Christ's deeds that we see over here. But the thing that we're going to find out is that with the old names, the Lords of Karma, the builders, they didn't give or take. That made them the only beings who didn't give or take. Well, Christ gave, and He gave, and He gave, and He gave, and He gave. He gave all these deeds, and He doesn't take. So Christ's gifts over here, Christ's deeds, transform the old version of the Old Testament merged with the New Testament with what we would call the Eternal Testament or the Eternal Gospel. And these are names that Rudolf Steiner gave to Christ when he was talking about the Lesser and Greater Guardian, but particularly about the Greater Guardian. He renamed and gave these names to Christ because we're in a new time. So let's go over what it is that would be the biography of the great I Am, Christ, and then a bit about how that affects the biography of the human individual's I Am. Well, we've talked before that Rudolf Steiner, we've talked about it, that Rudolf Steiner uh, has given us so much information on Christ that his, his, his cosmology of Christ is the most comprehensive of all. And he talks about three pre-earthly deeds of Christ, which really is a fourth pre-earthly deed also. And then there's a fifth and a sixth and a seventh. Well, if we talk about the three pre-earthly deeds of Christ, as far as I know, he's the only person who speaks of this. He says that as Christ was descending to the earth, he worked through... And I'm not going to get into those details. Um, one could say, as he's passing through the realm of the archai, the archangels, and the angels to come into the realm of the human, he did these three deeds. One, two, three. Well, actually, one, two, three. But to begin with, he created the ego of the human being. He created also what's called the sister soul of each individual. Each one of you out there has another part of yourself that is called the sister soul. It's pure. It's never come into physical incarnation. It has stayed in the realm where you were created as the perfect template of the cosmic I am. But because it's in a realm beyond space and time, it was. it's always been perfect. It's kind of like the sex cells of males or female humans uh, really don't degenerate. The telomeres don't fray. They're the most perfect cell, and they kind of remain that way. It's like a stem cell, which appears to be almost eternal, or an enzyme that seems to not be able to die. There's a part of yourself 
that is eternal, always was, but there's another part of yourself that comes into incarnation that has to go through these stages of what we would call initiation or repeated human incarnations so that you can then rejoin with your higher self still in the spiritual world. Now that is a concept that you cannot comprehend unless you've had the golden moment of illumination called enlightenment. Until you understand that time and space are illusion, and in fact lead to delusion, and they're called kama, or samsara, it, it's, or the maya, it's trying to delude you into believing that there is infinite space, which there isn't, there's finite, that you're mortal, and it's not true, you're immortal, that time and space really do exist and that they rule every part of you, including your spirit, which is a complete fallacy. So once you get over those, you can then comprehend this very th little phrase here, sister soul. It's also called the Adam Kadman when you're referring to Christ, or excuse me, when you're referring to Adam, the being Adam, the first human being. He had that sister soul in the spiritual world and it was called the Adam Kadman. Well, each of us have that. And all we're trying to do is surrender enough to the grace of the spiritual world, defy space and time and receive our higher selves, and there's three of them, into our lower bodies. So all we really have to do is accept your sister soul because it's already perfect. God would not have made us imperfect. And as we are growing into that perfection, as we are growing from a human into a God, as the Bible says, ye are gods, that is what we're trying to do, is re-embody our sister soul, which in fact is at a very, very high spiritual level, the level of an archai being. Now, three other pre-earthly deeds of Christ. This was the, not a pre-earthly deed per se, it was the creation of human beings, creation of the human I am, the human body, and all that the human body was, is, and will be. Then Christ entered in during the time of Miriam and helped human beings stand upright and walk, or stand erect and walk. This is critical. This is what separates us from the animals. It's what gives our arms the freedom to create and become co-creators, and our minds are both in our heart and in our head to become co-creators with the divine, to literally be a chalice for angels in the realm of thinking, of imagination, that realm of moral imagination where the angels live, flow into us. So as that can happen unless you stand upright, unless your brain becomes basically an island floating inside of your skull. It becomes a free being. It, it, it becomes subject to levity and subject to ascension. And so that's the first thing that happened, the first gift. Without that, we would be human. And then twice in Atlantis, Christ incarnated in this very special way, which we've described before in previous um, talks, and he transformed the human beings so that they could learn to hear and to speak in a language that could be understood by others. Huge deal, huge deal. Without that, you wouldn't have any thinking, because later, out of this speaking and naming, we have thinking. So the human being, before the mystery of Golgotha, that's what M-O-G means here, and this line means, here at the mystery of Golgotha, Christ came and historically made sure that every human being on the face of the earth had a, an ego, an I am, that had a resurrection cell of Christ in it, an ascension cell of Christ in our blood, in our heart, particularly in our heart, and in this chamber of the heart that Rudolf Steiner speaks about. So the mystery of Golgotha was also a deed of Christ, but somewhere right about in between this one in Atlantis and this one in Israel, in Jerusalem, you have also Christ appearing to Arjuna on the, on the battlefield uh, as uh, recounted by the story of the Bhagavad Gita. That is a mystery that you would probably have to go back to our research and articles if you really want to fully comprehend what that means, because it is a powerful thing. But as I said before, if we look at birth, death, and karma as the lords of karma, the builders, the lipikas, these higher hierarchical beings, karma is really the job of the sustainer god, who is, of course, Vishnu, who is, of course, Krishna. 
one of ten incarnations of Vishnu is Krishna. So when Steiner says that Christ also had a deed where he appeared as Krishna to Arjuna, it's highly mystical. Highly mystical, but it shows that all religions have running through them a golden thread and also basically premonitions of Christ, uh, prophecies of Christ before Christ ever came to the earth. Well, those are the created aspects uh, and the created aspects of the human being that are the deeds of Christ. But here we have the redeemed aspects of the human being. And notice that this is the physical, etheric, astral, and ego. Same thing happens. Again, Christ performs more deeds, and they transform the physical, etheric, astral, ego. So these are the old ones. These are the new ones. The new ones are, because human beings have yet to understand it, do you understand that you're immortal? Do you understand that the where you go to sleep, when you're asleep, where you go, that realm is the realm you go into when you die? That's the realm that you're born out of? If you do, and if you understand that you have a reincarnating human ego, an I am, then you can start to grasp the reality of immortality. And if that's the case, then Christ conquered death, didn't he? And he taught us how to conquer death. Because our Christ and souls are not limited or bound by death. Another thing that people forget in the works of Rudolf Steiner that he says that Christ basically is the source of our memory. He's basically the Lord of memory. He is the one who uh, gives us in our etheric body the capacity to remember that which has elements of the eternal in it that we carry from life to life. And so the karma of a human being is right there in the etheric body in the memory that was given as a deed of Christ in our time now. So if you really want to understand that phrase that uh, the Bible makes reference to, that uh, in the hour of your need, the words will be given to you. Well, that's what this is. When you need it, the memory capacities of Christ in the etheric, if we understand that right now there's a battle in the etheric realm where Christ once again is appearing, but this time only in an etheric body, and only, for, and only for humans who can see through the astral realm. So if you're clairvoyant enough to see through the astral realm and look into the etheric realm, you would see Christ there in a battle with the endarkening materialism that goes into the etheric realm of the earth after people die. In other words, people are bound by their materialism bound by their lack of spiritual thinking in almost a prison realm in the etheric. And Christ is there fighting for those beings right now. And you'd also be able to look all the way to the physical realm, if you were a true initiate, and see that Christ has already come. Christ has transformed the, the physical realm. The earth was in a stage of entropy. It is now in a stage of ectropy. The sun is, no, I mean, the planet is no longer a planet. It is becoming a star. And our star, our sun, is becoming a planet. And as that interchange happens over time, we will then merge again with the sun, but in a truly uh, new uh, manifestation, not like we see it today. Uh, but also, if you could really rise up out of our own atmosphere, above our Earth, then you'd be able to receive the Akasha and the higher two ethers called the Tree of Life. And that's what this is all about. This is going towards the tree of life that is inside of New Jerusalem. So once your soul handles all of these things and you purify them, then your spirit starts to handle these things. And eventually your soul will wed your spirit in New Jerusalem where the tree of life still springs forth with the rivers that can nourish us and with the leaves on the tree of life, which are for the healing of the nations, as the Bible says. So we have then memory given in the etheric by Christ. Then we have now what Rudolf Steiner informs us is that in the realm of the astral, which is where most of your desires, intentions, and all of your evil animal nature exists, Christ has already shown us that he's the Lord of Karma. And that if we can take quantum leaps now, it is no longer way, weight, number, and measure of the builders. Now... It's the mitigation of the Lord of Karma who has more power than the previous Lords of Karma. So Christ has the power to mitigate 
and to forgive and to transform and to merge in new capacities, to merge in future karma, to understand and to plan how wisdom will be transformed into love in the future. And so therefore, as the Lord of Karma, no one is really more personally aware of you and your deeds and your spiritual steps and your spiritual backsliding than the Lord of Karma, than Christ is. And so in the astral body, the new transformation is done through the fact that Christ has also become the judge of human karma, the judge of the earth, the angel of death. He's become Christ triumphant and the great counselor. And these new names, which are really continuing capacities of Christ to give deeds, then become the transformation of these and the redeemed capacities of the deeds of Christ in these elements here. And the last element is you change and transform your own ego. As you become selfless from your very selfish nature, in a way, you're supposed to be selfish up to age, you know, 21, 28, but after that, you really don't have an excuse. You're supposed to be selfless. But to be selfless, who's coming in when your self's going out? When your animal self is leaving, who's coming in? And this is what you have to decide. Are you going to uh, strive towards a Christ and self that communes with angels and archangels and archai, time spirits, and also with the spirits of the Elohim? Uh, uh, one of them named Jehovah, who ruled the moon. The other six work from the sun, uh, but not as physical limitations, just as outer shadow manifestations of these spiritual beings. So when you transform your lower ego into your higher ego, your lower self into your higher self, you basically become a Christened self. You start to take on the very characteristics of Christ. And in a way, this is a higher transformation of what used to be the group ego of human beings. Because in the past, we didn't have personalized egos that could do abstract thinking. And we just simply followed what the priest kings told us to do in the priestesses. But now, we have to self-initiate ourselves. We have to find Christ in the physical, while we're incarnated in the physical realm. Find Christ also as we approach the lesser guardian. Because if the lesser guardian is now Michael, Michael is the countenance of Christ. He's the face of Christ. And the sword that he has was given to him by the Trinity. And the scales that he holds, well, that's what the Holy Spirit is basically doing with us. If the Comforter has come and the Comforter is advancing us, then we know that the scales are balanced. Also, we can mention that there's three beings that can, uh, of the Divine Feminine Trinity, and that the being of Sophia is also on the other side. When we say Michael as the Lesser Guardian, as we're going to sleep, when we wake up, we actually see his mother, Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, the beings who work through the combined beings of the Kyriotides, the beings of wisdom in that hierarchical rank. So Michael slash Sophia is who we actually see on the threshold as the lesser guardian. And who do we see for the greater guardian? That would be what is called the Sophia of Christ, the wisdom of Christ, the cosmic Christ, as Rudolf Steiner calls it. So. Sophia is also in this mix, and when we usually refer to a midwife of the soul, we're referring to Sophia, but this is also the midwife here. Christ is the midwife of your spirit, and that is the reason that he knows your entire karma, what your karma is from the past, what it is now, what it's going to be in the future, um, steps that can be taken to mitigate your karma, uh, steps that can be taken for forgiveness, um, so on and so forth. And then Christ, of course, the process of initiation is to learn to commune with the beings in the spiritual world. And all of them, from angels to the seraphim, all are in direct contact permanently with the being of Christ. And each human being, as we evolve and we start to accept the new characteristics of Christ, the new deeds of Christ, uh, we then are in that process of ascension, and we are then moving into the spiritual group soul of the individual, which is the Christ himself. But now it merges back into that 3D holographic image that has been broken into many shards. But when it joins together, it is now 
bigger than it ever was because it has all the individualized aspects of it that are carried from life to life by each human individual. So when Christ created the first templates of the sister soul, when the new Christ himself merges with our perfected sister soul, it will actually be much, much more than that sister soul. It will be everything that we have gone through, all the suffering, all that it took to develop wisdom in this physical plane will be in the Christ himself, which basically then makes the creation of the Trinity greater than it ever was before. Now, in the past, we have lots of names for Christ, and if we look at Old and New Testament and St. Paul and the Gospels and so on and so forth, we can find that Christ is called the conqueror of death. But now, he's called the angel of death. So, you needn't be afraid of the angel of death. He's working directly with your guardian angel, and when he comes, this angel of death is actually bringing you the opportunity to enter into your reward in the spiritual world. And so we shouldn't be afraid of the angel of death, but the conqueror of death, death has been the motivating force for the fear that has driven the world into one war after the next, into hating your neighbor, into hating anyone but yourself. And so once we conquer death, then the angel of death then becomes our friend. And when we die, as Rudolf Steiner says, it's like taking off a raincoat as we enter a house and hanging it up and entering. It's, we don't need it anymore. We don't need the physical body anymore. We simply have to realize that the angel of death is there as our friend to show us what is beyond the threshold of death. In other words, that realm where the sister soul lives and the realm where your Christ and self lives in the future. And that's what the angel of death is actually there to do for you. We know that um, some would say that um, the second member of the Holy Trinity is begotten, but that simply to me means manifest. Father God is unmanifest. The Son God, the Creator God, is manifest. That is, that is Christ. He was there at creation. And that, there are references to that in the Bible. So now what is He? He's the judge of the earth. All that was created, He is now going to judge. And the earth itself, without Christ entering into the physical body and dying, and His blood basically homeopathically redeeming the death forces of the earth that were happening through entropy, so that ectropy and levity could enter the earth and we could then become a star, without that, then the earth would have died. So Christ is now the judge of the earth because He has saved the earth. And He is currently saving the etheric body that gives life to the physical earth. And that is His task now called the Second Coming, or Christ's appearance in the etheric realm. We know that Christ is often called the Redeemer. He has atoned through His blood so that there'll be no more blood sacrifices of animals or humans. No more sacrifices except the sacrifices of our good deeds on the altar of giving those deeds to the spiritual world as nourishment. That is what the Redeemer does, and that's why the Redeemer has these new capacities that are developing in the human being, that are being taught to them, and has these new names, and these basically new jobs, as it were, but they're the same job. It's just like Vishnu. Christ has always been the sustainer of the universe. Um, if we wanted to call Father God the Creator, Christ is the sustainer, and the Holy Spirit, um, uh, then uh, comes along as that which is the midwife at your birth, that which is, sees the lower self die and sees the higher self born. So Christ is called a Redeemer. Uh, of course, in the old way of looking at it, He's shown on the cross, and His death on the cross is the conquering of the world. Well, in this new fashion, in this new view, in this new capacities, Christ is seen as Christ triumphant. In other words, not on the cross, but is Christ rising up through ascension into the heaven and basically being there for everyone as they die to meet them in the clouds and to basically be their guide if they are triumphant, if they have put the lower self behind them and turned to the higher self and uh, sought the help of angels and archangels and archai and Christ and Sophia and the archangel Michael and all these beings, all these saints, 
uh, whether you call them uh, Yidams or Yoginis or uh, Mahatmas, it doesn't matter. People who have developed morality have imprinted that into the etheric world. And that is there that you can model after, or it's there to support you. So you can say, I wish to become just like St. Francis. And the being of St. Francis, who had perfected his astral body and taken on, basically, the overlighting of the perfected astral body of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, that St. Francis is still there, so we could approach it through going through St. Francis, or going through Christ himself, or going through what is called the Nathan soul, or going through the Holy Spirit. All of these are the path of the triumphant soul that is wedding the Spirit, and that's what Christ wants. Christ weds Sophia. Love weds wisdom, and when they do, it is triumphant. New Jerusalem comes back down to us within our reach, and we can then enter into New Jerusalem as the eternal souls that hear the eternal gospel and sing that new song and gather around the throne, the triumphant throne of the Lamb on that throne, which is depicted in the, in the Apocalypse. So Christ triumphant is something that we must now claim for ourselves. It's not just Christ who died for atonement, it's Christ the Redeemer and Christ the Triumphant. Then, of course, the Holy Spirit, another name for Christ, he says, I will leave, but I will send the Comforter. So now, it's not just the Holy Spirit that is the Comforter. Christ is considered, according to Rudolf Steiner, called the Great Counselor. So if you're wanting counseling at night, when you go to sleep in the spiritual world, or after you die, or you wish to understand your karma, then you approach the Great Counselor. Why? Because he has the compassion to be able to mitigate, to be able to change and forgive karma. And this has never happened in history before. But now that human beings have the ability to truly have a conscious ego, an I am that can go into the spiritual world, it also has the capacity to be forgiven of, of many heinous sins that uh, were made in, in great unconsciousness in lower stages of development. And then, of course, the judge. As we see in Apocalypse, the judge, you know, separating out the different types of animals, separating out the good from the bad, separating out the evil, casting the evil into the, into the lake of uh, death, fiery pits of hell. The judge. So, if you've been a bad person, you're not going to like Christ when you see Christ as the angel of death. You're not going to like Christ when you see Christ as the judge of humans. You're not going to like Christ as you see him as the counselor because he's going to be telling you that you need to stop your immoral deeds. So, oftentimes, Christ is seen in the bottom line, in the end, during Apocalypse, the end of days, as a ruthless judge that has no mercy on those who have sinned. But, Read the whole story and remember that the Apocalypse is a great story of triumphant success of the Spirit and that no matter what, even if the human beings do not evolve and do not sing the eternal song and do not wear the white tunic as described in the Apocalypse, it doesn't matter. No one is ever lost. They'll simply be recycled and start again at whatever level they're at. And they'll again start and be given these gifts, and then they'll be judged for what they've done with it. And so now, the judge of human karma, the individual judge of karma, is Christ, is the greater guardian, is the Lord of karma. And what we must do now is understand that this Lord of karma isn't there to punish you, that not all karma is bad. We have come into our modern age of hearing of paying it forward. In other words, doing things now for good karma for the future. So there's good and bad karma. And as Christ is the Lord of karma, it is our wonderful opportunity if we can understand the nature of Christ in relationship to this, and thank heavens we have Steiner to give us this new insight about the Christ so it can become more uh, profound and even deeper than it was before. We need to embrace Christ as the Lord of karma and understand that He is the being who has given all of these deeds to help us to the point of our evolution that we're at now, but that he also gives all of these new deeds to us so that we can transform and redeem our lower self and turn it into our higher self. 
so that we can begin to work with the Lord of Karma to make sure that we seek enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings and we seek initiation for the sake of communion with the hierarchy.